Okay, now we're going to have some fun. Everything you thought that you felt secure in now, in your pro-life view, I'm going to make an attempt to undermine. And I'm going to use a couple of philosophers to do it. The first is going to be Judith Jarvis Thompson, an MIT philosopher who in 1971 penned a very interesting essay. And here's what she did. She looked pro-lifers in the eye, and she said, I'm going to grant for the sake of argument that the fetus is human, I'll call it a person, and I'm going to kill it anyway. And I'm going, to just, I'm going to justify killing it anyway on grounds that although the fetus is human and although it has a right to life, it does not have a right to use the body of another person to sustain its own life if that person wishes to withhold that support. And then she spins a tale to illustrate her point. And here's the tale. I'll paraphrase it for you. You wake up one morning to find yourself surgically connected in a hospital to a violinist who has a rare kidney ailment. And this unconscious violinist is now back to back with you in the hospital bed. And as you're waking up, the hospital administrator appears at your bedside and says, um, let me explain what happened here. We're really sorry this happened to you. But this violinist has been attached to you by the Society of Music Lovers, and it's been determined that you alone have the blood type and the kidney resources he needs to sustain his own life. And because he has a right to life and will die unless he's connected to you, you must remain in this position for the next nine months, after which you may detach yourself, he will be cured of his disease, and you can get on with your life. Thompson then asked the following. She says, it would certainly be nice if you granted this and allowed him to use your body that way, but must you? If you are not thrown back a little bit by that analogy, you should be. You should be, at least initially. Now, I'm going to argue it doesn't work, but do you sense the power of her argument? What makes it powerful? What is the one thing she's doing that is always powerful when you're watching a debate? She's grant, yeah. Yeah, when you look your opponent in the eye and you say, I'm gonna grant your primary premise, and you still lose. That is just dramatic beyond all belief in a debate. And that's exactly what she does. She looks us in the eye and says, pro-lifer, I'm going to grant your premise that it's a human being. I'm going to grant that it has a right to life. I'm going to grant that it's a person. I'll give you everything you want. And abortion is still justifiable. And the way she does it is saying, just as that woman has a right to decline support to the violinist who's been attached to her, so she may, if she chooses, decline to support the fetus that's attached to her. Everybody with me? Okay. I'm, go I'm going to ask you now to give me your feedback on why you think this may not work, but before I do, let me just give you some parameters that will help here. The kind of argument that Thompson is making is an argument that involves parallels. In other words, for her case to work, being hooked up to that violinist has to be parallel to a woman being hooked up to her own child in ways that are morally relevant. If the parallels collapse, her argument collapses. So, let's go after the parallels. Do they work, yes or no? Well, for one, um, right off the bat, we can, uh, it can only apply in the sense of because it was forced. It wasn't under consent. It would only uh, be against uh, or support abortion in case of rape. Mm -hmm. um, just to start, because I mean, if you consent to have sex, it's kind of a. Uh so barring cases of rape, the woman can't really say that she bears no responsibility for the pregnancy because she willingly engaged in an act that has a natural stopping point that involves pregnancy. Yes. yes. Yes, I would say that is a problem with one of her parallels. Yeah, what else? 
have no biological relationship to the violinist. You have no biological relationship to the violinist. Okay, you're getting really, really warm. I want you to unpack that a little more because you're right on the precipice of a brilliant statement and I want to give you credit for it. <laughs> the fetus is uh, you know, born in your body and your, it has your DNA. The violinist uh, just appeared. The doctor gave you the violinist. They chose to, to attach you to them without even your consent. Uh, I don't know what else uh, better way to put it. All right. You're, 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 you're getting hotter by the minute and you're getting close to the right answer. Anybody else want to jump in and build on what he just said because this is key. Is it that it's not natural? The pregnancy is a natural process, but the violence being surgically attached to you is not. Okay, so this violinist has just been arbitrarily and unnaturally hooked up to you uh, where the mother has a natural connection to her own child. Okay, you're, st you're getting red hot, all of you. There has to be a responsibility for that child, maybe. I mean, yes, there is, but maybe this is where this is going. Um, for instance, once a child is born, that, ch that mom has a responsibility to bring that child to a hospital and let the first put them in a trash can. Mm -hmm. So she has a responsibility to that attached child. Now Thompson's going to argue she only has a responsibility to that child as she voluntarily assumes it. That's the whole point of the analogy to the violinist. Uh, now I agree with you. You're right, and I think her. That's just going off the subject then, because it no, goes into other laws, then, right? Because that's a law. Yeah. Well, at least in the state of California. Once yeah. Happens, yeah. So. Clearly our law does hold parents responsible for children. You're right. And this is a problem with Thompson's argument. It's not this particular problem, but you're right. That is a problem. All right, what else? So also, the body's designed to carry pregnancy. I mean, you're not really designed to have someone attached to you. Mm -hmm. And it, it's not even fair to say you're laid up in one position when you're pregnant. You can still live and do things. I mean, it's, it's, I mean there's, I'm sure there's some cases where people are laid up in pregnancy. Pregnancy is not a prison bed the way that Thompson would make us to be. The body is designed to handle this naturally. I think that is true as well. Uh, Mike, and then we'll jump over here. There's a difference between withholding support and, and directly killing somebody. In other words, I'm not sure I'm saying this right. Um, withholding, for instance, in the case of the unborn, you're not really withholding life support. You're actually in a position to kill the child. Yeah. Abortion is much more than just withholding support, isn't it? It's actively killing another human being, in this case through dismemberment or poisoning. Uh, Frank Beckwith has a great quote. He says, calling abortion merely the withholding of support is kind of like suffocating someone with a pillow and calling it the withdrawing of oxygen. Uh, a lot more is going on here than just withholding support. Uh, you're absolutely right. Is it true that with attaching a violinist, it's more of a parasitic, it's not of you, but with your, with like the consents or the consensual sex or however it happened, like you're permitting part of you to become someone else, like something else, but it's still of you, it's not of something else attaching mm -hmm. to you. In other words, if Thompson is hinting that this is a parasitic connection. It really isn't because a parasite, for one thing, is always of a different species than its host. And here we have a child that is not only the same species, it's the mother's own child. Let me tie in what a lot of you were saying a moment ago when I teased you on this and told you we were getting red hot on the answer. Here's the thing. Thompson want, wants us to believe that a mother has no more duty to her own child than she does a total stranger unnaturally hooked up to her. That's what you have to swallow if you're going to buy her argument. A mother has no more duty to her own child than she does a stranger who is unnaturally hooked up to her. Hence, the very thing that makes it plausible to disconnect yourself in Thompson's picture here is the very thing that is not true of the mother's relationship to her own offspring. I think that's a huge flaw in her argument. 
In fact, in debates, I use that very phrase. You're telling me that a mother has no more duty to her own child than she does a kidnapper who's been hooked up to her unnaturally? Kind of brings it home. That's exactly what's going on here. Uh, somebody else, one of you said that pregnancy isn't a prison bed, and you're, you're exactly right. Yeah, perfect uh, example of this. You have to believe that when women are pregnant, that they have been imprisoned in a way that is so unnatural and so violent. And in a moment, we're going to look at Eileen McDonough, who actually takes it much further than uh, uh, Thompson does in that regard. But you have to believe that women are being subjected to something that is so cruel and inhumane that no reasonable person would make them go through it. Uh, and that's simply not the nature of pregnancy. I won't argue that it's uh, unpleasant at times. Uh, my own dear wife, uh, morning sickness was a problem in all of our four kids, and violent morning sickness. You don't want to know what I'd go out in the middle of the night to get sometimes. But uh, th these things, though unpleasant, are hardly a prison bed the way that Thompson would have us uh, believe. Yes? Especially since she did admit that that is a human life in the womb. Mm -hmm. Couldn't you trot out the totally even more and say, okay, well, this is a human life, then could, you, could the same woman do this to her two-year-old because he was an inconvenience or, you know, because the toddler or child is essentially attached mm -hmm. to the caretaker, not physically, but... Right. Mm -hmm. Well, what Thompson would say at that point is, uh, I actually think your, your point has plausibility. Here's how I think she would respond. She would say, after birth, there's no longer an attachment. The child no longer has a direct relationship to the mother's own body, such that the child must rely on the mother's own body alone for survival. After birth, that child could be cared for other ways. That would be her reply. But I think you raise a good point. If Thompson is going to concede that the unborn are human, that they are persons, and that they have a right to life, all of which she concedes in her case, then why would the mother's duty to the child differ before birth than it would after? I think we could ask that question and press that in on her and make it a little bit uncomfortable for her, but I think her standard answer would be, well, there's no longer an attachment, but I don't think that gets, gets her around the problem if we present a cumulative case showing where uh, her paradigm just doesn't work. Still needs to be taken care of. Oh, yes. Yes. So maybe it's not her, but it's somebody, you know? She yeah. Just... What if she just abandons the child, gives birth, and leaves? Mm hmm. I think the key to that to bring her home, too, is the, the woman has to be in isolation where she's, if you, if you explain it, where, like, say, she's on a deserted island or something, and she's the only one that can viably support the child, is it morally right to relinquish that? And I think people would naturally say no if that's the only means of support. Well, except that. The hospital bed, she'd be in. That one, that one falls down for me because in the hospital bed, the violinist, she's already been told she's on a desert island and nobody else can save him. So, for that, for that, I don't see that as working. I'm not sure if I caught what you meant. Well, weren't you just saying that that you're using the correlation that if the mother is in on a desert island? she's the only person that can take care of that child, I don't know whether you meant inside the womb or outside the womb, then she'd be re obligated to do so. Yeah, it was in, it was in response to that, the, the argument that once it's outside the womb, there's other people to take care of the kid. Right. So the, so the parent no longer has a responsibility. But it'd be like, let me try out Tyler's here on Desert Island, and I'll throw this one out that like, I mean, or you mentioned a, a culture where like, you know, breastfeeding is required, and you just breastfeeding a kid because you're the only one that can. I mean, yeah. These are excellent counterexamples. Yeah, let's take that breastfeeding one. In fact, Dr. Bernard Nathanson used that in his book, Aborting America. What is going on here is a claim that a woman has a radical, absolute right to bodily autonomy. That's the argument that's being proposed with this analogy. And Nathanson raises that very example. He says, well, what if you got an infant that can only tolerate the mother's milk? That infant cannot have formula, and what if the mother just decides, no, I'm not going to use my body to feed the child, and she, she refuses to feed it and commits infanticide? Do we think she did anything wrong? Well, I think our intuitions scream absolutely she did something wrong. Uh, let's look at this whole theory of women having 
a, an absolute right to bodily autonomy. This came up in a debate I did with an abortion doctor at UC Davis back in 2006. Uh, this abortion doctor, uh, in her response to my opening statement, said, well, even if Scott is right about the uh, fetus being human, women still have a right to bodily freedom and integrity that we must respect above all else. So she's making that claim for absolute bodily autonomy. So during cross-examination, here's the scenario I put to her, which I used from my friend Rich Papard, who came up with this. He's a, a, a doctor who works with us at LTI. And he came up with this analogy that he had told me about a few weeks before, so I sprung this on her. I said, well, imagine uh, that a patient of yours comes to you, doctor, and she's pregnant, and she's suffering from terrible morning sickness, as some women do. And imagine further, she wants you to write out a prescription for thalidomide to help relieve her of her, 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 her nausea symptoms. Now, what does thalidomide do to unborn human beings? Causes them to be born without limbs, right? I said, would you write that prescription? She said, absolutely not. I wouldn't do that. I said, why not? Well, because it harms the fetus. I said, fair enough. If that woman goes behind your back and goes to someone else who is willing to write the prescription and she takes the drug and gives birth to a child with no arms four months later, do you think she did something wrong? What was her answer? Yes, that, that was not right. What do you think my reply was? Really? So you're saying then that a mother may not harm her child by taking thalidomide, but she may kill it through elective abortion. And by the way, who are you to say what she can and can't do with her body? She has an absolute right to autonomy. It's none of your business. In fact, wouldn't it be the case, doctor, that if she purposely wanted to take the drug to give birth to a deformed child, that's really none of your jurisdiction. She has absolute right to bodily autonomy. Now the audience got it right away, what the problem was. When you make these claims, for absolute autonomy, you can't limit it. Dr. Ray made a good point using the example from Judge John Noonan when people argue for an absolute constitutional right to commit suicide. You can't then turn around and say, oh, well, only in cases of grave illness or only when you're in this, the final stages of dying. No, if it's a constitutional right, an absolute right, you can't place limits on it. Same dynamic is going on here. There's a medication that people can take for acne known as Accutane. If you're a woman of reproductive age and you are taking Accutane and you are sexually active, you must verify that you are using at least two methods of contraception before you can take access to Accutane. The only purpose of those requirements is to protect the fetus because it, there's no health issue for the mother here in requiring those contraceptions or that, those two types of contraception. The only concern in play is the welfare of the unborn human at this point. Is it a violation then of the woman's bodily rights to say she's got to do that? Nobody says it is, but shouldn't it be if a woman has an absolute right to bodily autonomy? Shouldn't that we look at that and say, no, you, you can't demand that of her. You can't even ask her. It's her business. You have nothing to say. One of the best responses to the, the, the claim for absolute bodily autonomy came from a blogger who goes by the uh, uh, name Paul W., who supports abortion. But he doesn't think Thompson's argument or arguments like her really work. And here's the thought experiment that he throws out there. I think this is absolutely brilliant. He says, suppose we have a mother who becomes pregnant and decides that she just doesn't want to let the fetus pass through her body. She's not going to let it pass her cervix. And so she just leaves the fetus, assuming it were possible to do so, leaves the fetus inside her and lets it sit there even though it becomes conscious and aware and wants to get out. And she simply says, my body, my choice, it's my slave. 
and she leaves it in there for 70 years, and finally when she dies at age 90, the fetus inside her dies, the unborn human dies at age 70, and she just leaves it, doesn't let it trespass through her birth canal. Paul W. then asked this question, would that really be right to do, treat the fetus as a slave in that way? And I think we'd have to say that if a woman has an absolute right to bodily autonomy, it's hard to argue that what that woman did was wrong. Now, it's a thought experiment, so obviously it's not something that translates into practical reality. We can't keep a fetus in there for 70 years, but the thought experiment still stands, supposing we could. Now, it becomes a little less far-fetched when we consider the case of Melissa Ann Rowland. Melissa Ann Rowland was pregnant with twins, and she unfortunately was a crack addict. And it came time for her to near the time of, of birth delivery, and the doctors informed her that she would need a cesarean section because her children in the womb were in distress. And her response to the doctors at the hospital was, no, you're not going to cut my body. I don't want any scars on my body. And then she went outside to have a smoke. Finally, several hours later, the staff prevailed on her to do the emergency C-section. By that time, one of the twins had already died, and the other one was near death and addicted to crack. Guess who defended Melissa Ann Rowland? The National Organization for Women. And you know what? They're right if women have an absolute right to bodily autonomy. Who are we to say that what Melissa Ann Rowland did was wrong? Because after all, it's her body, her choice, right? Any questions on bodily autonomy uh, before we move to the next example of this. Yeah, does this have some parallel to like the Good Samaritan laws? Which I don't really play on like, the idea that you know, someone's about to die, you could help them, but you're like, that's my body, I don't have to grab you. Or is it only like internal or? I'm not sure I understand. I might not be. I'm, just, I'm wondering like, if there's an analogy that kind of attacks the argument with, like, for instance, the Good Samaritan law where you're I think that's the law. If you're if you're in a situation someone's maybe lives at stake, where you can do something to help them, you're actually obliged to do something to help them. Uh, yeah, the question is, are you obliged to help someone when it's in your power to do it? Uh, with your body, right. And that could vary state to state. I don't think there's a federal standard on that. But I mean, certainly morally, we would say you should. I mean, if someone's drowning and you have the ability to save them, you ought to do it. Uh, but in, in Melissa Rowland's case, what's interesting about this, she just flat out said, you're not scarring my body. Now, as a feminist who's arguing for absolute bodily autonomy, I don't think you can do anything but support her in that decision. I don't, and of course, that just strikes us as so counterintuitive. One thing you could say, although you better be prepared to, to show that the parallels don't work, but there is a part of me that wants to look at Thompson and say, your argument is just plain nuts. And I don't even need to refute it. It's just plain nuts. Now, I don't think you're going to get away with that at a local university. But I think you could reasonably say that. When someone is going to argue a mother has no more duty to her own child than a total stranger, that is nuts. But you do have to be able to demonstrate that the parallels don't work. Let's stand up and take a stretch break. So, Okay, uh, there were a couple of points about uh, Thompson's argument before we move to Boone. And Alan, say for everybody what you just said to me a moment ago. Okay, so um, this is a response to yes, the violence argument. And, and the point that you were making is that uh, the reason why it's not a parallel situation is that uh, it presumes that women have no more obligation to their own child than to a complete stranger. And so I was suggesting, well, as a way to illustrate that, you say, well, let's just change the whole violinist illustration and say, uh, imagine you wake up surgically connected not to a violinist, but to your own child. Now, how would that change your response in terms of how you would mm -hmm. uh, Yeah, it changes dramatically. Because, exactly. Because it illustrates, well, hey, you know, we have obligation to our own children and that is to care for them and protect them and if they need help to give them that help.
That's right. Woman wakes up. She's attached to her own child. Now do we think she can slit the child's throat just because it's there and she does not want to give her support? Uh, that kind of makes it personal to people. And, and I think what Alan brings up here, we need to do this with Thompson. We need to demonstrate that Thompson's view is counterintuitive. And wait till you see the steps that Eileen McDonough and David Boonin go to in just a moment, I'll show you, to defend Thompson because it gets more and more nuts the more and more people try to defend this view. But it is being defended, so uh, that is important. During the break, it was also uh, a question that was raised is, well, although Thompson's argument doesn't seem to work in normal circumstances, it seems to work pretty well in the case of rape because there the woman was forcibly connected to another human being. What about then? Well, one thing we could say is, all right, fine, Thompson's argument appears to work in the case of rape, but nothing else. Now, I don't think it does work in the case of rape. I'm going to talk about rape in general in just, oh, another 40 minutes or so. We're going to be dealing with the hard cases as part of the general arguments people bring up on the street in favor of abortion. But let me just give a quick answer. In this case, I think we need to weigh the suffering of the woman who's been unjustly forced into pregnancy with the suffering of the fetus who will be killed in this situation. And I would argue, short answer here, that the suffering of the fetus is immeasurably worse than what the mother would go through for the nine months. Therefore, it is not justifiable to uh, kill the fetus, even in that case. But I'm going to give a more uh, robust answer to the rape question in just a few moments. But that's my short answer to that, that question. Uh, just another uh, comment on the Thompson's argument. She argues that a baby is only a baby if you choose, if you choose it to be a baby. If you don't choose it, you can not call it a baby, which you can make, if you can make the same argument with a, a two-year-old. If you choose not to uh, say you don't want the baby anymore, you can use the same argument and get rid of a two-year-old. The question is, doesn't Thompson assume that basically it's not a baby unless you want it. I, I would actually say Thompson does agree, she concedes for our purpose that it's a human being with a right to life, and so I don't see it that way. She's conceding our major premise. She's just trying to show that even if you grant our major premise, abortion is still justifiable on grounds that the mother has a right to bodily autonomy. That's the basic gist of the argument here. One other example about bodily autonomy we can throw out here, suppose a woman for no reason whatsoever, simply wants to go have a limb amputated because she likes the way people look with one arm. Would a physician be justified turning her down for that? Yes. Yeah. Uh, now, again, if she, if she has a right to bodily autonomy, what, what if she wants to mutilate herself? You see, if autonomy trumps all other moral considerations here, uh, we really do step into some difficult uh, problems. Let's talk about Eileen McDonough. Eileen McDonough takes Thompson to a whole new level. Eileen McDonough, a political science professor who I was scheduled to debate at the University of Illinois in 1998, but she backed out when local abortion rights group on, camp, uh, rights group on campus uh, successfully sabotaged the debate, or at least they thought they did. She then refused to come. I showed up anyway and uh, gave a presentation to a couple of hundred people and uh, um, just went ahead with it. Uh, there's a whole story to that. We'll talk about it later. Uh, it, in fact, I relate it in the, the book, The Case for Life. So if you want, if you're curious about that, you'll have to buy the book. Um, <laughs> McDonough goes to a whole different level. Eileen McDonough says basically this. Abortion is an act of self-defense. And just as a woman has a right to use deadly force to defend herself against a rapist who invades her body without consent, so she may use deadly force against an aggressor fetus who invades her body without consent, and the state ought to pay for that defense the way it funds police officers to protect people in general from unwanted assault. Pregnancy is assault is what it boils down to. That's the first premise of her argument. The second premise, really the, the one the argument is built on, is this. 
Just because a woman consents to sex does not mean she consents to pregnancy. Okay? That's McDonough. Just as a woman has a right to use deadly force against a rapist who invades her body without consent, so she may use deadly force against a fetus who invades her body without consent, and you, the taxpayer, have an obligation to fund that act of self-defense on her behalf, the way you would law enforcement in general. Just because she consents to sex does not mean she consents to pregnancy. Now, I'm radically summarizing her argument, but that's the, that's the, the core of it right there. All right? Okay, folks, dive in. How are you going to deal with that one? Besides saying it's just plain nuts what it is, but what, what are you going to say? This, this is another argument, though, where she, she's letting uh, the pro-lifers say that, yeah, the, the, the fetus mm -hmm. is human and everything. Yeah, she but, does say it's human. Okay. Although, it's interesting, she says that pregnancy is not caused by the parents having sex. Pregnancy is caused by the fetus implanting itself in the woman's body. Uh, and so she would, I mean, it gets really nuts, but that, that is the, the essence of it. Um, but how does she know, well, she's comparing it to a rapist who has an intent to harm. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. uh, how, how would she know that the, the fetus has an intent? The question is, how can she compare the fetus to the rapist? The fetus doesn't appear to harm the mother the way the rapist is. She would say, yes, it does. She would say that the fetus invades her body, massively interrupts the woman's bodily integrity, uh, causes her to have physical challenges, and it changes her body radically in ways that uh, maybe she doesn't want. Not that I'm aware of. She just says whether it intends to do that or not, that's what it does. It's possible to do something and not intend it, I suppose. Right. And, and but there, there's a whole paradox of the, the rapist has an intent, which is what um, a judge will look at when determining the guilt of mm -hmm. the party. Um, whereas the fetus, even though it's doing all these things to the woman, has no intent. So it's not guilty on the level she's trying to equivocate between the rapist and the child the I think you could start to challenge her on that point and, and begin to expose one of the flaws. You could push that. On arguments that seem or seemingly so silly as hers, are the pro-choicers even listening to her in any way since that seems kind of extreme? Like, is it given respect on their side? I think... I think McDonough, Peter Singer, Judith Jarvis Thompson harm the other side at the street level more than they help them. But in the academy, all bets are off. Uh, something that would be completely nuts to someone with a high school education or less suddenly becomes plausible when you have a PhD after your name. Uh, you know, so these things come up. These things do come up in academic settings. Uh, I think one of the reasons the student pro-abortion group at the University of Illinois sabotaged that debate is they knew full well what McDonough was going to say and how counterintuitive it would strike the normal mom and pop in the audience. Abortion is, a, or excuse me, pregnancy is equivalent to rape, uh, which I think is the main problem here. Why should we suppose that a, a, or why should we suppose that a rapist has the same relationship to the mother's body that her child does? That's the question I was going to put to her in the debate. Why should I suppose that this rapist has the same relationship to the mother's own child? And, and that's where we got to drive this home with people at an intuitive level. Go ahead, Megan. Yeah, I can say that word right. She's begging the question, in a sense, by assuming that pregnancy as it, it takes a toll on the body the same way that the trauma of rape does. Yeah. And she hasn't got anything to prove that the overwhelming majority of pregnancies are actually wonderful experiences for the mother and very healthy and natural. Um, so there's a problem there. Major problem there. I agree. Uh, does pregnancy change a woman's body? 
Yes, it does. Uh, by the way, so does growing older, right? Uh, so does exercise. So does a lot of things, okay? But although it changes the woman's body, how does the change in her body to pregnancy, with pregnancy, differ from a change in her body from violent assault? What's the difference between those two? Her body doesn't like itself. Her body doesn't like itself. Her body changes because of the pregnancy, but it's, it's doing it itself. The, mm -hmm. the fetus isn't like causing her belly to grow or anything. It's, it's making room for it. What is natural? What is unnatural? If I could put you two together here, would it be fair to say that pregnancy does change the woman's body, but it changes it in ways it was designed to handle? Uh, and therefore, to say it's like rape is just crazy. Uh, what a stretch. Um, yeah, that, that is a, a big deal. What about her view of consent? Just because a woman consents to pregnancy does not mean she consents to sex. All right, wait, no, I'm sorry. Let me get... <laughs> Jet lag. That's what gets when you get four hours sleep a night on the West Coast. Just because a woman consents to sex does not mean she consents to pregnancy. Well, we just proved you're all awake because you caught that. In fact, you caught it quicker than I did. I probably wouldn't, if you weren't laughing, I probably would have just gone right on, you know? <laughs> oh man, this is great. Wait till my wife sees that one. Okay, uh, now let's take that. Just because she consents to sex does not mean she consents to pregnancy. So she's gonna draw this dichotomy between those two acts. Pregnancy is a natural consequence of having sex, so I don't see how you could split the two and say that she is not responsible for that action. Here's how she would answer you. She would say, suppose there is a female jogger running through New York Central Park at night, late at night, in a very uh, suggestive jogging outfit, and she is mugged and raped. Is she responsible for that act just because she went jogging at night in a suggestive outfit? But that wasn't the issue that you raised. It was the issue of consensual sex. But that's her reply to this. But they're two separate. I agree. Arguments. But that's her reply. Now, I think you're on to what the problem is here. Okay. Um, first of all, Matt, Frederica Matthews Green has a great response. She said, yeah. Uh, in this case, though, there can be no mugger until there's two joggers that combine genetic material to create him, right? <laughs> so I think that's a great response. Uh, but you're pressing her on, on a key point here. But, but take this whole consent issue. I consent to sex. I don't consent to pregnancy. Can you think of any other area where we would buy that kind of reasoning? How about this? I consent to sex but not getting an STD. Is that going to fly? Uh, I consent to buying a winning lotto ticket. Can I consent to buy a winning lotto, lotto ticket? No. What's the only thing I can consent to? Buying a ticket. The results are, you know, I got to take it however it goes. Can you consent to a successful surgery? No. What do you consent to? Surgery. surgery. The final result, you're not consenting to that. You're consenting to the initial behavior, not the final result, right, in, in this case? Uh, suppose that I'm playing baseball with one of my sons in the backyard of our home, and he gets a hold of a pitch that I throw him, and he drives that ball with the bat flying across our yard and into the neighbor's backyard where the ball makes contact with the sliding glass door and shatters it. Suppose I go knock on my neighbor's door and say, Mr. Lopez, I'm really sorry that we broke your window, but I need to inform you that we're not going to pay for it. Because although I consented to play baseball with my kid, I did not consent to break your window. Is this going to work? Uh, no, I've got some real problems here. Uh, do fathers have to pay child support even though they didn't consent to the birth of a child? Yes, they do. So this idea that we can segregate consent with the pregnancy or can segregate sex from pregnancy, I, I just don't see um, how this would work. Any questions on McDonough? Is there anything to be said for just the fact that kind of 
kind of like what she was saying, that pregnancy is a result uh, of having sex without any, or you know what I mean? I guess there's always a chance, you know, but there are, there are ways that we can prevent pregnancy and the fact that she, whoever has chosen not to, you know what I mean? So you've already started the process by choosing for like, in, like for the majority of cases or whatever, you've chosen not to use any kind of protection or anything like that. From, right. Is there anything to be said in there? Or is it kind of just like you can go back with? McDonough would come back and say, but there's still cases where people get pregnant despite using protection. And she would say there's a fundamental issue here that contraception, that's nice, we ought to use protection, she'd be in favor of that, but she would still say that a woman, what we're talking about here is the fundamental right of the woman to segregate between consent uh, for sex and consent for pregnancy, and would argue that just because she consents to the one does not mean she consents to another. What I think you could do, though, is drive home the point that there's a natural connection between those two acts. You can certainly do that and should. Uh, it, it, it is that way. Um, this is a design, a clearly a design thing, and you're within your rights to argue that way. I think with normal people who aren't in uh, academia, that, that's a powerful argument. Uh, academics, all bets are off. Do these people have children? I don't know. I wouldn't want to be one. Yeah. Well, here's something else. Let's take McDonough, McDonough's consent issue here. Let's say a woman consents to be pregnant at three months, but at nine months suddenly withdraws that consent. Yeah, I mean, what would be the argument against late-term abortion at that point? Yeah. Couldn't you continue to extend that to, I mean, just because she agreed to give birth doesn't mean she gave consent to raise the kid or to... I think you could. ...any kind of maternal responsibilities. Sure. Yeah, just because she agrees to give birth doesn't mean she agrees to feed the kid. Now, that's, a, that's where we're going next, believe it or not, with David Booty. I think to make the feminist bad, too, you can turn around the paternal side just because I bothered a kid doesn't mean I agreed to pay child support. So. Yes, exactly right. Exactly right. And there's a guy named Keith Pavlicek who's written an article that uh, makes that very point. Why couldn't a father say that? Uh, the only reason you would deny him that would be a crass form of sexism where you deny him the same right you're giving the woman because of his gender. That, that essay by Keith Pavlicek, by the way, is found in a book uh, called The Abortion Controversy that was edited by Frank Beckwith and Louis Poyman. Uh, you can get it at Amazon, and uh, his essay is in there. It's, it's a very good response to this. David Boonin, who you met last night on the organized cortical brain activity <coughs> allowing the fetus to suddenly have interests and or suddenly have a desire for a right to life. Well, he's now in the second part of his book, he dedicates to a defense of Judith Jarvis Thompson. And he tries to make Judith Jarvis Thompson's argument stronger. And the primary, he, the primary question he's dealing with is this. Do parents have a special duty to their offspring? If the answer is no, then of course the woman can have an abortion and it's no big deal whatsoever. Because Boonin recognizes that at some intuitive level, to suggest that a woman has no more responsibility to her own child than she does a stranger is going to strike people as strange. So he's going to try to make that argument seem plausible, that a woman doesn't have a duty to her own child, and therefore an abortion is okay. And here's what he's going to argue. He's going to argue, get ready, just be aware, this, this gets dicey, all right? He's going to argue that we must distinguish between being responsible for someone's neediness, okay, and being responsible for the fact that they exist with the result that they're needy. Confused? You should be because this is crazy, but let me go over that again. We've got to distinguish, says Boonin, between being responsible for someone's neediness and being responsible for the fact that they exist and as a result are needy. So here's Boonin's illustration that kind of makes this work in his mind. There's a physician who saves the life 
of a man who is suffering from a terminal illness by administering a medication to him. And this medication pulls him back from the brink of death, saves his life. So the physician has extended the life of this guy, saved his life. But then a short time later, in response to that medication, the man develops something like a kidney ailment for which only the physician's blood can be used in a transfusion type context to save this man's life again. Is the physician therefore responsible and required to use his body simply because this man who he caused to exist now has a resulting need? Everybody with the illustration so far? And Boonin says, well, of course not. Well, in the same way, says Boonin, just because the mother caused the child to exist with the result being that the child is now in need does not mean the mother has a special duty to the child. Everybody following the argument here? If you're not, it's okay. Because this is really, uh, gets to be nuts, quite frankly. Anybody want to take a shot at what you would say to Mr. Boonin if he were here? <laughs> no, don't do that. You don't want to say idiot, but uh, I'd say the argument's nuts. I would agree with that. So, like infanticide then would be okay? Infanticide would be okay because why? Uh, well, there's no obvious. Well, I, since now you have a child, he's saying you have a child, but now you don't have any kind of obligation to do anything else for it. Is that right? Is that what he's saying? Arguing? Uh, he's arguing the mother has no special duty to her child simply because she's the parent, the fact that she caused the child to exist with the result that the child is now in need uh, does not obligate her to uh, care for the child. Uh, and he uses that example of the physician. Let, let's start here. Is he saying inside or outside of the womb? Or is this He's talking about pregnancy. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. But, but we could ask the question, can, exactly. he, can he really draw a line outside of pregnancy? But, Let's just stick with pregnancy for the moment. Is there a difference between, again, withdrawing, uh, need, like not choosing to give the child support versus intentionally killing the child for abortion? Or is that I don't think that comes into play here. I think what we have to go after is his analogy and ask the same question that we asked of Thompson. Do the parallels hold up here? Let's go to that surgery example. The doctor saves the guy's life. He gives him medication, saves his life in the course of that surgery uh, or that medical treatment. The man lives, but then subsequently develops this uh, condition as a result of the medication, all right? Let's ask, is that situation parallel to pregnancy and the unborn? I was just gonna ask about the correlate. You answered my question. Okay. D do you see a parallel or do the par does the parallel start to fall apart? I, I think, giving someone life versus saving someone's life, I don't think that's... Bingo. Think that's Bingo. Good. Absolutely right. What did the physician do? Did he cause the patient to exist? No. What did he do? Save Graciously extended his life, right? And as Patrick Lee points out, there's no parallel here to pregnancy. In pregnancy, the mother and the parents in this case, both, they cause the child to exist and place him in a needy position. In the case of the physician, the physician generous, genu, or, um, sorry, graciously extended the man's life, but he didn't cause the guy to exist. He extended his life with the result that he subsequently later develops this, this problem. Uh, there's not a parallel there. It's, it, it doesn't relate to pregnancy the way that, that Boonin would need it uh, to be. Patrick Lee has a, a good counterexample to this. He says, imagine that I'm out in my speedboat one day on the lake and I go sailing by, flying by a pier with a bunch of children in it, and the wave that I create is I whip my boat past them, knocks three or four of them into the water. Uh, suppose I decide that although they're in a needy position, it's not my fault that they don't know how to swim, and it's not my fault that some of them might drown. Because although I place them in, cause them to exist in that needy position, it's not my fault they don't know how to swim. Do you, do you see where he's going with this? Uh, I think that's a, a, 
a good comeback to this whole idea. Uh, what I hope you're starting to see, do you find yourself getting wore out just trying to keep track of these justifications? I think there's something wrong with a view that it lacks explanatory power and we have got to do mental gymnastics out the ear just to try to piece it together. Something ought to smell fishy to us when we've got to work this hard yeah. to come up with a defense. There is a place for making careful distinctions. We, we want to, you know, uh, certainly do that. I thought Dr. Ray made a number of careful distinctions on end-of-life issues today uh, that we need to make. Uh, but when something at its core is just so counterintuitive that we've got to patch it together with counterexample after counterexample, I, I, I just don't know. I, it just starts to strike me as not being very plausible on the surface of it. There was one man, at a, uh, as I understand it, there was uh, one man who responded to Boonin by saying, suppose there was a, ba a baby making machine in, in the room here with a big button that said, you know, baby maker. If you go up and punch that button, you mean to tell me you bear no responsibility for what comes out of that machine? Uh, and I think that's a pretty good direct way to get to the core of the problem here. So any questions on Thompson, Boonin, McDonough uh, at all? It, it seems a smaller point on that last analogy that Boonin gives. It, it seems like the, there's no co the continuity isn't there where a woman you know, conceiving a child and having a pregnancy, there's this continuity in the relationship, whereas a doctor saves a patient's life and the patient, you know, shows up years later and you owe me a blood transfusion. It seems like there, there's no connection, there's no continuity with the doctor and patient where there is with a, a mother. Yeah, I think that that's true. Uh, Rich Prepard has one more example that, that could help here. I mentioned him a moment ago. Um, Thinking of Boone, and he said, imagine there's a mother who is a surrogate. She agrees to carry a, a child that will be given up for adoption. And she goes into a cabin in the woods a couple of weeks before she's due. And everything should be fine there. The cabin has plenty of supplies of food and everything. But unfortunately, a freak winter storm arrives. And she is snowed in. She has plenty of supplies on hand, but she can't get in. No one can get in or out because of the snow. During that time, she gives birth to the child. But here's the problem. When she contracted to carry this child, she made it very clear that the minute she gives birth, she will not care for the child one bit. So she gives birth, and she says, I wrote it in the contract that I will not use my body to sustain this child. The fact that the child is needy, I may have caused him to exist, but I'm not responsible for his neediness, therefore I'm going to let the child starve. Under Boonin's worldview here, uh, how are you going to re reply to that? I, I don't know how you would. I, I think that's a great counterexample to uh, deal with Boonin's thinking. Okay. Uh, here's what I want to do. You guys are doing so good. It's, uh, you know how hard it is to be late on a Saturday afternoon and still keep your brain going? And because I just fried it with uh, Thompson and Boonin and McDonough, take another five minutes, stretch, and then we're going to do the home stretch and wrap this thing up. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.